everybody sorry for a bit of bit of delay um, due to the technical difficulties, but we are back on. And so before we start today's session, I would just like to share a story with you. Um, it's actually a story from Africa. So in 18th century, there was this craze among the European countries to rule over the African countries. And Italy was no different. So Ethiopia during this time was still not claimed by anyone. And, it, and Ethiopia stood proudly as few independent countries of Africa. But it was severely affected by long famine during that period. The ruler of Italy saw this as an opportunity and so Ethiopia as an easy target to enslave and showcase the victory medal to the world. So Sunday, Sunday the 1st of March 19, uh, 1896, a well-equipped army invaded Ethiopia with their modern guns and artillery. On the other hand, stood an Ethiopian army of poverty-stricken, feeble, helpless peasants to defend their country. It was a war of swords against guns, axes against artillery, powerless farmhands against the skilled soldiers. Any war strategist will say that this was a no-brainer. The poor Ethiopian army would get blown away like a dry blade of grass in a whirlwind. However, the outcome of this war was startling to the rest of the world. This battle of Adwa, Ethiopia came out as the winner and stood as pride and inspiration for Africa and rest of the enslaved world. And the psychoanalysis of this war states, it wasn't the wars of arms and ammunition, but it was a war of mind versus body. Whilst for Italy, it was a battle of egotism, but Ethiopians, fought for their conviction. Their mental strength changed their physical attribute. Yes, their mental strength changed their physical attributes. With their unprecedented victory, they set a great example for the world, a true testimony of power of mind. And this power of mind is what we are going to explore today. So last Thursday, um, we learned from Dr. Deepa Modi, uh, the medical ways to manage fibromyalgia and chronic pain. She also brushed up on some chemical imbalances caused in the brain leading to this pain. Um, now, for, we, we're just gonna further expand onto that, uh, onto that and see um, how, how, how mind can help this. Um, on today's session, we're going to go through understanding the steps, the understanding the chronic pain, the tools and kits of the of the psychotherapy, such as uh, CBT, ACT, emotional intrusion, mindfulness, breathing exercise, and then we'll go through four pillars of mental health which is awareness, connectedness, insight, and purpose. And that's gonna be our schedule for today. Now, one of the statistics shows that there are more people suffering from chronic pain than diabetes, heart disease, and cancer put together. Now, with such staggering numbers, it's very important to understand it properly. Uh, usually, pain is a symptom a symptom of something going wrong structurally in the body. Research confirms that pain is actually a protective mechanism of a, um, created by the neural pathways of our brain. However, in case of fibromyalgia 
and chronic pain. The pain itself is not a symptom, but it itself becomes a disease. And that is why it is in extreme cases of allodynia, a feather, just, just a feather on the body feels like a, a, a torch, um, you know, a blow torch on your body. This is where we know that the issue is not, not with the sensation. So it's not the structural, um, you know, cut or damage to the body, which is causing that sensation of the pain. But it's the brain which is interpreting this sensation is the root cause of the situation. So in such cases, the root cause is actually the amplification of the signal into the brain, which causes this. Simple sensation gets amplified several times and brain interprets this as a danger. Our am amygdala part of the brain is hardwired for millions of years to interpret danger with flight, fight, or freeze response. We all know that. Um, now, in case of chronic pain, this signal seems to be a con in a, into a continuous mode, irrespective of the real danger not being there. And the way out of this is to reprogram our brain. Our brain has the plasticity, and that means that we can train our brain to remain in the balanced state. We can train the brain to regain the homeostasis. Um, so let's just take some examples. 70% of the women have endometriosis. Most of us know what endometriosis is, um, but only 10 to 15% of this feel pain. So similar example is more, everybody above age of 50, if we do the MRI of their uh, neck region, it shows the de degenerative disc disease, but only 10 to 20% 20, 20 of them feel the pain. 85% of the neck pain doesn't have any identifiable structural issues. 35% of the people after knee replacement still feel the pain. So what exactly is going on here? So the structural deformities is, is, is not always the case. We All these statistics is pointing us in a direction where it's the brain which is resulting, which is causing the pain actually. So for fibromyalgia and many such chronic pain, the structural body is fine, but the signaling is the issue. It's like a guitar which is functioning fine, but amplifier is set to too high. So what, what common um, you know, observations we all um, hear who have suffered um, you know, or gone through such pain or any of our relatives who have gone through that pain would observe is, Usually such chronic pain is multifocal. So compared to a structural pain where, for example, if there is something wrong, wrong with this bone and I just particularly feel the pain here, in such chronic pain, which is like a brain generated pain, it's multifocal. So you, you, feign, uh, you feel the pain in chest or in the back, in the shoulder, in the neck, you know, it's like multifocal, various places you're feeling that pain. The flares of this pain is unpredictable. So some, sometimes it's perfectly fine and sometimes all of a sudden without any, you know, structural reason, it just flares up. Most of the patient describe it as agony or a burning sensation. Usually there is a long-term history of it. And generally it has been observed that there is a history of ACE, which is adverse childhood event. Usually it is also accompanied by sensitivity to light and noise. It's common in women. And we all should question why, um, you know, perhaps something to do, do with the nurturing tendency of the woman um, and, and, and the personality traits. So most of the personality traits of people suffering with chronic pain is self-sacrificing. 
attitude. Self-criticism, too much of a perfectionist attitude. Urge to please others. These are the common traits which have been found statistically shown among the people with chronic pain, which we, we know are quite common characteristic of generally, the, uh, generally women. People are genetically predisposed to this type of situation. Stress, trauma, surgery, these type of things have triggered this type of pain. And generally, there is a quick relief seeking behavior. So something like an addiction, you know, like, uh, you, you know, people in stress um, have a puff of a cigarette and feel that, oh, you know, their stress is relieved. So it's, it's like a quick relief. Though all of us know that stress can't be relieved just by a puff of a cigarette. So in similar type of fashion, so somebody with a chronic pain will, uh, will look at a couch, um, a, a sofa, and, and just feel that okay, you know, if I lie down, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna feel the pain, or my pain will go away. And when they lie down, they are in a, um, you know, very um, relaxed state which means that parasympathetic nervous system is activated rather than the sympathetic nervous system, which triggers the fight flight response is the parasympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for the rest and the digestive system gets activated when you're lying down, when you're relaxing. So all of a sudden, because body is relaxing, the brain takes away this danger alarm and the pain goes away. Now, brain reprograms this as that by lying down, my pain goes away, which means it reprograms it that by getting up and by doing activity, I feel the pain. So that reprogramming of quick relief behavior is quite common among people with chronic pain. And it's a spiral, it's a vicious cycle after that. So usually, you know, people with chronic pain will describe it as a, you know, sp spiral effect or things going out of the control. Um, usually there is no structural deformities found or it's, it's usually the result of the neural pathway issues. And then there is this vicious cycle of pain and the fear of pain. So because there is pain, there is a fear of pain. And because there is fear of pain, uh, there is more pain. So that vicious cycle keeps going on. And that's why people with chronic pain, they, they, their pain gets worse with the time, as the time passes because of that cycle of pain, fear of pain, and then more pain type of cycle. Now, all these chronic pain is in the brain. And that is due to the disturbance of the balanced state of the mind. Usual triggers for this, are emotional triggers. Um, research has shown that someone who is hurt emotionally, the same That's brain physical. center gets activated as physical injury. Yeah, was. Um, this is how the emotional pain can trigger the physical pain because the centers in the brain where Emotional pain triggers something and physical pain triggers something is same. So that's how a emotional pain actually can trigger a physical pain. So a neural pathway can be created just by an emotional pain. Uh, I mean, we all have felt that, um, you, you know, uh, when we are sleeping and if we have this uh, moment where we are falling down, we feel that in our stomach and our body, our, our feet moves as well. So it feels so real. So mind is creating that picture, that image, uh, which is so, uh, such a, uh, it's a, that documented reality, which is so real that body can react to it, that body reacts to it. So mind can re create that reality to which we can feel that physical pain. People who have tried uh, virtual reality goggles have known that quite well. You know, I, I myself just a couple of weeks ago had tried that and, uh, in, in this virtual reality goggles, uh, once I had put them on, I could see like through, you know, underneath here, I could see that uh, um, there is a floor under my feet. But in the reality, in, inside the reality scope, it was like a plank. 
and I was supposed to walk on it. And uh, <laughs> I could have fallen down. So I could not put one foot ahead on that plank with the fear of falling down. Now, though my eyes could see from underneath that there is a floor, a nice good, good floor underneath me, my mind, which was looking at this little plank and the huge buildings around it, was picturing that as the real thing. And so my body wouldn't allow me to put my next foot forward. So it wasn't the real uh, reality. So this is how mind can augment the reality so much that our body reacts to it. So mind can create that pain, which is actually not the pain, but it actually, you know, uh, created by mind. Um, so the, um, many people who would have seen <laughs> virtual reality goggles would have felt that. Um, children who have grown up uh, feeling unsafe or neglected, um, you know, mm, or have gone through any abuses, uh, can sensitize their brain. And, and that can trigger the danger alarm into their brain. Now, such sensitized brain can trigger pain sensations later on during, uh, during their life. Now, by other stressful events, such as like a car accident or a breakup of a relationship or things like that, can then bring that memory back and can then create that brain back into their mind. So that has been also a common observance. Um, it's important to note that brain is activating that pain. So to experience the brain, brain needs to activate that. I mean, we all uh, who have kids or you know, people who have, who have known kids, we know that kid, kids cry more when they see, if they have fallen down, they cry more when parents go rushing towards them. Why is that? Why is that? So is the kid not feeling the pain before that? No, when the parents are rushing towards them, the mind is signaling something bad has happened, something serious has happened, more serious than what you're actually feeling. And so to experience the pain to its entirety or to that, to, to that extent, it's the brain who needs to activate that pain. Uh, so... Now that we sort of understand a little bit more about how brain is creating that pain and how brain is responsible or the chemicals in the brain or the message, the neuro, neural pathway is responsible. Let's just understand how we can break out of this vicious cycle. How we can train our mind. So there are two things when it comes to training. One is the declarative learning, which is something like what we are doing right now, you know, sitting down, studying text, listening to something. That is equally important. But the other part is procedural learning, which is putting it into practice. Both are equally important to bring the real transformation, to understand the subject and to actually put that into practice. Um, we can harness the power of the neuroplasticity to heal ourselves. And this is the bottom line we all need to understand that brain is a very plastic, uh, you know, plastic uh, organ. And because of that plasticity, we can manipulate it. We can train it. And how amazing. And that actually can heal ourselves in various different things, whether it is stress, whether it is anxiety, whether that is chronic pain, so many of these things, depression, we, we, can, we can use that power of neuroplasticity into a, in our favor. So I'm, gonna sh I'm going to share a couple of techniques today, um, tools and techniques which have proven helpful. Uh, these tools do need a lot of practice and patience. It's not a quick win, it's not a quick fix, but if we practice it, we can reprogram our brain. And that reprogramming can really bring us out of this vicious cycle. And I hope that this exposure will, uh, uh, today's exposure will allow you to find your own ways to manage your own pain. Um, 
first we'll start with CBT. So CBT is actually cognitive behavioral therapy. It is an evidence-based practice where we understand that feeling, thoughts, and behavior are very much interconnected. And we address any cognitive distortion using power of thoughts, power of feelings, and power of behavior. So let's start with thoughts. So one basic technique is objectively observing thoughts. Now, this can be done as, um, you know, some people like to imagine it as, uh, you know, leaves flowing through the water, or some people like imagining as, um, you know, these flowing thoughts as, uh, you know, objects which are just moving through a conveyor belt. We can perhaps just try that. We can close our eyes, all of us together. Yeah. Let's close our eyes. And just simply observe. Observe the thoughts. It could be an image. It could be a to do list. Or it could be the sense of smell of the food which is being cooked in kitchen. The, the image of that food. Just let these thoughts pass. Allow them to pass in a non-judgmental way. Deep long breath in, deep long breath out. Gradually, we'll bring ourselves back into the room, opening up our eyes. This mindful meditation actually allows us to separate us as an observer from our thoughts. And mindful meditation class, which we have on Monday, will usually help uh, benefit us to practice this more and more. This dissociation from the thoughts or from the feeling that we are feeling or the pain that we are going through really helps. It allows us to train our mind and detach ourselves as an observer. Think of, think of anesthesia. Yeah, when when we go into when somebody goes into operation theater and uh, you know before doctor operates them, ad anesthesia is administered, right? So what does that actually do? Body is still being cut. Yeah, so the the pain trigger should still be there. Why do we not feel the pain? Why does the patient does not feel the pain? Because the chemicals of anesthesia has actually created a barrier between the mind and the part of the body which is being cut. So that dissociation which has been created by the chemical, that barrier that has been created by the chemical can be triggered. That type of barrier can be triggered by mindful meditation. So we can mindfully dissociate ourselves from the side of the pain. And that is the power of that mindful meditation. That's the power of training our mind. And that's why the research done among the Buddhist monk has proven that they can very successfully dissociate their mind from the side of the pain. And so their pain threshold is very, very low compared to most common people who have not practiced mindful meditation. Um, this also helps us to overcome the anticipation pain. So that is something called anticipation pain. Um, uh, last week, Dr. Uh, Deepa Modi discussed about an um, app called Curable. That app was uh, contributed um, usually by Dr. Howard Shub Shubiner. So Howard Shubiner quotes a very beautiful example of a type a type typist. So in olden in 60s, 70s, there were actual typewriters where you know. 
the switches were quite hard. So the typist um, used to used to start feeling the pain more and more towards uh, as the week progressed, which is quite understandable, one would say, because, you know, she is using her fingers more and more. Then she was asked the question, is there any other time that you feel the pain? And she says that she feels the pain on Sunday evening. So, so that is a classic example of anticipation pain. So there is no physical injury to her fingers, but it's the anticipation of her using the typewriter in the following day is causing her that pain. And such mindful um, uh, meditation allows us to dissociate ourselves from such anticipation of pain. So that is other thing that we can experiment, uh, we can try and, uh, you know, take our fear away. Fear of uh, uh, pain can be take, taken away. The anticipation induced pain can be taken away from the real pain and it can be controlled better, it can be managed better. The other thing important uh, technique uh, that is used is understanding thoughts and the emotions are not the facts. Thoughts and emotions are not facts. So let me quote an example to explain this. So once in my office, one of the line manager came to me, very distressed and uh, very sad and unhappy, rather touch bit angry actually. Um, and his reason for distress was uh, that, why am I being given uh, most work? Why am I being penalized like that? What wrong have I done? And I'm not happy about it. So I sat down with that person and explained to him that it's actually the faith in your ability, the trust in your capacity to deliver the results and the reliability that you demonstrate that we assign you more work. So once he actually grasped that, uh, he rather took it as a compliment rather than a curse. So, now, so for him, now it, it gave work, having extra work gave him the ecstatic feeling, not a feeling of anguish. So this is a classic example where understanding the thoughts and emotions that they are not facts. They are just, um, it, it, you know, something that we need to interpret. So we might be feeling anguish, we might be feeling anger, but we need to understand and, uh, what is the reason behind them? What is the fact behind them? Um, another example that we could discuss for this is, uh, um, you know, when we get a, a thought in our mind, so thoughts act, with the laws of motion. So <laughs> by that, what I mean is that when you think more and more about a thought, it gets momentum. The momentum becomes so compelling that it then arouses us with a feeling that pushes us into action. Uh, and until we intervene, that momentum keeps going on. So, we sometimes we are not in real danger, but we get this thought, this fear, this emotion of danger. When we get this thought of fear, not all the time there is a there is a danger in front of us, right? But because there is this emotion of fear, our brain straight away triggers that fight flight mode. But if we rationally distinguish and tell our brain that the fear that I have is not a fact. The emotion that I'm, uh, my mind has, or uh, the emotion that I'm feeling is not a fact. The thought that I'm having, the fear that I'm feeling is not a fact. There might be just the rabbit behind the, uh, you know, behind the wood. It's not a lion jumping on me. So when we can rationally, you know, distinguish between two, it allows our mind to not to go into that flight fight mode and allows our mind to remain in that parasympathetic mode of the system.
parasympathetic mode of nervous system. So that's another thing that we could practice. Uh, you know, deep breath does the same thing as well, which breaks that cycle. Now, one thing important to note is that when it is a quick response required, of course, our amygdala is going to come into action. Because the more advanced part of our brain, this frontal part of the brain or the fr frontal lobe of the brain is the more advanced part. And that uh, it takes, takes longer to respond. So that's why that part is not the one which is going to give the quick response. Another um, you know, um, technique that we could use to train our brain is understanding the connection between thoughts, feelings, and a situation. We often, that, we often think that a situation triggers a feeling. For example, a difficult situation, one individual may think that I have no hope, I feel so distressed, I feel so depressed, I feel so just, I have no way to where, where, where to go. Another individual in that similar situation might feel or might take it as a challenge and think to herself or himself that what, whatever doesn't kill me is going to make me strong and will grab the bull by the horns and solve the problem out. So you can see that the situations are same, but the interpretation of the situation is that is what triggers our feeling. So if our interpretation is that uh, is of feeling, uh, you know, hopeless out of that, that we can't handle that, then it will make us feel depressed. If our interpretation of that situation is that it's a challenge and I'm, I can do it, I can handle it, I can control my mind, I can handle that pain, then the way we would react to that is gonna be different. So it's not the situation which brings the reaction or the feeling, the thought, it's the interpretation of that. So the mindful observation of ourselves that what am I interpreting from this situation is another technique that we can apply on ourselves. Now, most many of the Gujaratis who are here on this group would have heard this story of Anandi Kagalo, where, <laughs> where there is this crow who, uh, you know, um, the king wants to punish him because he is just way too happy. And, you know, king is not very pleased with uh, him being happy all the time. And so, you know, he gets put in mud and he just, uh, you know, slips on it and just enjoys that. Oh, it, you know, I'm going to have fun in that. Then he gets put into, um, you know, well, and he still, you know, swims into it and says, you know, this is how I learn swimming. He gets, you know, put into thoughts. So basically he gets put into different, different situations, but his mental state just remains balanced, just remains in that happy state, just remains in that stable homeostatic state. And that is what his training of mind can do. Another technique that we're gonna talk about today is shifting the perspective or having that paradigm shift. So it's not easy to do that at all, but we can start by changing a single word. Example, if I'm telling myself that I have to get up from the bed, I have to do the exercise, this might just feel like I have to do it, and it just feels like, um, you know, um, as if I have no way out, as if I'm, I'm being trapped in that thought. So even just one word change in it, that if I rather say, I choose to do it, rather than I have to, I choose to get up as I want to get better. I choose to do exercise as it is good for me. So this will have a different impact on how we feel. And it, 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 it won't turn on our trigger of a danger signal in the brain. If we, if we tell this to ourselves, if we train our brain in that way. 
So it is a very liberating feeling to know that I'm not damaged. I can heal myself. I don't have structural issues. I can get better. Dissociating ourselves from the symptoms, focusing on getting better. Once we can understand this, we can reduce, we can begin to reduce the dan uh, danger alarm. We can worry less. We can stop anticipating. We can stop monitoring. We can stop allowing pain to dominate our thoughts or every action that we do in our life. We can start re-engaging into social activities. We have the ability to change our neural pathways uh, and that is the beauty of neuroplasticity of our brain. And so this is, some, this is another thing that we can try, just change the perspective. How we, what we say to ourselves every day when we talk to ourselves. In fact, that brings another thing. Sometimes we have this um, a habit of overly talking negatively to ourselves. So when all of us do self-talk, you know, that, that's just human nature. All of us do self-talk. But when we are overly emotionally abusive towards ourselves, that's not healthy for ourselves. I'll, I'll quote an example. So my sister, my, my eldest sister, when she was um, um, little, it, was, it wasn't easy for her because she was like the only child of the whole family. And, you know, her errors were looked through a magnifying lens. So, <laughs> and, uh, you know, her little mistakes will get criticized. So over the course of time, whenever anybody will call her stupid, she will accept that as a reality. And her mind will just shut down. This followed in her adulthood and the word stu stupid will just trigger a neural pathway in her brain, which will generate the fight, flight, freeze response in her. And it took her really ages to talk herself out of this self-deprecating self-talk and to regain her confidence. So observing which thoughts are not helpful for us and taking opposite thoughts to ourselves, so she had to tell her that, no, I'm not stupid. I'm, I'm smart. I'm smart. I can do it. I'm better than. I'm better than what people around me are thinking. I'm better than what, I, uh, what they are thinking. You know, she had to. Uh, so it's replacing the negative thoughts with the positive affirmations. And that is also part of training our brain. Or another way could be just ignoring those thoughts. But if you're able to ignore, excellent. But it's sometimes easy to replace it with something else rather than just ignore the thoughts. So it's not that easy to actually ignore sometimes when it becomes a repetitive case of uh, you know, thought process. Another um, a technique that we could use, uh, sorry, Nehaji, what, what's the timer? Sorry, I'm not overly going over the time. My God, 18.45, wow, okay. Um, so I'll, I'll rush through a few of the techniques. So noticing mind movements. So for example, you know, we might be sitting in the room, but mind is wandering somewhere else. So we are not fully present in that moment. So, that, uh, so bringing the mind back into that moment is also another technique that we can, can um, develop to, 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 to make ourselves more self-aware. And that actually links into another technique, which is called being effective in the moment. Now, how can we be more effective in the moment? By making the most effective choices in the situation. Now, how can we be most effective? How can we make most effective choice? Only when we actually accept the reality. So that, brushes upon another technique, which is called acceptance. Acceptance commitment therapy, in which we are actually accepting the re unchangeable reality. It's not about accepting everything. It's only about accepting unchangeable reality. For example, my, my, um, my dad recently had a mild stroke. Um, so it's not that he is you know, paral uh, completely paralyzed and bedridden or anything. He is able to do his normal routine work. It's just 
you know, certain capacity of his holding up a spoon or, you know, having that grip has changed. But his continuous thought in the mind is, you know, how in past I could do so much and now I can't. So the acceptance of the reality that after a stroke, you are bound to face certain diminishing uh, capacity. Uh, if, if we don't accept that reality, we will be continuously in that state where we are unhappy. So accepting the reality and then making the most effective choice in that reality, that whilst this is my reality, ah, there you go, you know, the pain has arrived. But it's about saying to ourselves that, yes, pain, I can see you have arrived, but you don't get to choose. You don't get to choose how I live in my life. So that is acceptance of reality, but at the same time, deciding, making the choice what I want to do with my life. I'll quickly brush up on the other uh, techniques, which are feelings-related techniques, such as increasing um, the emotion regulation skills, uh, which is not allowing the emotions to rule over you, but rather ruling over your emotions. Um, another uh, technique is uh, about writing down your emotions. So that technique has also proven very effective, but you write a letter to a dead or alive person and just pen down every emotion that you're going through. Um, and that um, actually expressive writing therapy has also bought a lot of results with uh, chronic pain patients. Um, other uh, things uh, related to the behavior therapy is choosing the behavior. So it's about uh, making that decision that whilst my back might be hurting, but I'm not, uh, rather than saying that because my back is hurting and I'm not going to go anywhere, we are, we are changing the narr narrative. We are changing the action that we take because of that back pain. So we are changing the narrative by saying that my back is hurting, but I'm not going to let that stop me. I'm not going to let that, um, you know, pain change what I do in my life. So that type of objectively observing our behavior and commanding it to change um, uh, has um, definitely both, um, you know, impactive results. Uh, we have already been studying mindfulness meditation uh, during our Monday sessions. And pranayam also has got a very similar impact where pranayam is a pranayam or any breathing exercise for that matter trigger the parasympathetic nervous system of rest and digestion. Uh, this naturally brings us out of the control of the sympathetic nervous system. The activation of parasympathetic nervous system prompts the body to rest, to rejuvenate, to regenerate efficiently, allowing the system to detoxify and to return to the homeostasis. And that's why it's important that we regularly practice these breathing techniques. Um, we, I'm sure on Monday session, we, uh, you know, we, we, are, uh, we are going through many such techniques and that allows us to take ourselves out of this autopilot mode and open up the door of the mind control. Lastly, uh, I would like to discuss four main pillars of our mental health which is awareness, connectedness, insight, and purpose. So awareness is about the capacity to focus our attention and resist the detract, uh, uh, any distraction. So meta-awareness is knowing about what our mind is doing. And that is the key for the real transformation. Connection is about developing those interpersonal relationships, showing the appreciation towards what we have, showing the kindness towards all, developing that positive outlook towards the life. And knowing that I'm the integral part of this family, of this society, of this nation, making that connection, that is the second important pillar of mental health. The third important mental, uh, pillar is having insight. Insight is about 
the narrative that we have about ourselves. Are we too self-critical or are we living in a utopia? Are we telling us, observing ourselves in a very negative light? Because if we are, then that is a true prescription for, this, uh, for depression. And if we are living too much in a utopia, then that's not right either. And usually the reality is somewhere in between. But insight is all about this narrative of how we look upon ourselves. And the fourth important pillar of mental health is purpose, purpose of living or living a purposeful life. It's very important to have a higher purpose in the mind. American anthropologist Margaret Mead once asked in her lectures, uh, she was once asked by her students in a lecture, that what do you think is the first sign of civilization? And in response, she didn't refer to any old artifacts or fire or wheel. She rather showed an image of a broken femur bone, which had healed. And then she explained that in animal world, no one with broken femur bone, which is the thigh bone, is, you know, no one with broken femur bone lives until that is healed. Hence, it is the first sign of civilization and culture, where this person who's uh, uh, with broken bone was provided for, was allowed to heal. A broken femur bone that had healed is the evidence that someone had taken care to stay with this person who had fallen, had bound his wound, had, create, had carried that person to safety and tended that person through the recovery. Helping someone through difficulties where the civilization starts. And we are at our best when we, when we help others. Let helping our fellow beings be our higher purpose of our mind. And that makes our purposeful living the fourth important pillar of our ment mental health or healthy living. I will leave you with that thought and welcome any questions. Let me start, Varsha Ji. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, uh, you explained different therapies um, and different methods. How do we know which one is the best one for me? Is there a way to um, which one might be better for me personalized or it is equally for everybody? I would say it is equally for everybody. It's more about trying the method and seeing what differences it is bringing into me because it's all about training the mind so some methods will train certain part of the mind some methods will train other parts of the mind so it's about training our how we feel how we behave and how we you know think so all three things need to be trained um, and so i would say that we should try all different techniques and see what works for us There's a question I'll answer on the chat box. Uh, the Monday session is all about uh, mindfulness, meditation, and psychotherapy. So it's another 12 weeks every Monday, six to seven with the same Zoom ID. Uh, and we will be practicing what we just learned. Uh, so different techniques, that's where we do the practice. And in between, if anybody needs to see the personalized session or therapy, uh, which is not helping in either of the groups, then they are welcome to join one-to-one -one as well. Um, so that is all we do. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Varsha. Thank you, Varsha Ji. And 
thank you for the wonderful section that you have explained everything the uh, about the meditation the mindfulness and everything is that be okay and i have a few questions with that uh, why don't we take along with the meditations and some of the herbal supplements instead of we taking you did mention about anesthesia and some of the painkillers maybe instead of the taking the some of the painkillers anesthesia why don't we take some of the herbals that are the natural herbals that like a food supplement that will help us to go along with the meditations like along with the meditation to cure the some of the chronic pains uh some of the it, it, it at least it, it will help to you know like to do something uh, to reduce the pain in the brain because of the some of the chemical products which has been in the and the natural supplements what do you think about it? would you prefer that herbal products are not my area of expertise however i'm sure neha ji might be able to point you into right direction who could have uh, uh, you know more expertise in the area of ayurved who could guide you through the herbal products uh, uh, in terms of anesthesia i was just quoting that as an example where yeah. uh, anesthesia just uh, you know how anesthesia creates a barrier that's how we yeah. can through practice create a barrier Uh, through training our mind um, but yeah um, definitely you know in terms of yeah. uh, herbal products um, by all yeah. means you know um, i'm sure neha ji will be able to point us into right direction um, yeah. with herbal expertise yeah uh, we should uh, ayurved has uh, is a rich science very rich science yeah that's what i'm just pointing out along rich science and it is very personalized so uh, again there is no one herb one cure for all that is of course and then overuse or uh, self medication is more harmful than any benefit so in terms of that we would always suggest that uh, never do it unattended uh, supervised by a physician ayurveda physician and also making sure that your gp or your physicians know about it because sometimes we are not very much sure that how the drug interaction works between your current medication and the ayurved even though it is uh, health uh, natural supplements but there are chemical substances there so it could interact with each other as far as pain is concerned yes uh, when it is trauma related uh pain conditions like fibromyalgia ptsd and there is a generalized pain uh then there is a lot of um uh, non herbal medication way uh, like nasya marma so these are the external application which is not taking a pill or a supplement in terms of medicine but it is more of um increasing and enhancing the capacity to uh, cope with the pain so the similar mechanism which works to support the brain and body healing but uh, i would say if using as a self practice these are the much safer way rather than having supplements orally right okay thank you thank you thank you dr neha and varsha ben thank you very much welcome kamleshi very welcome yes anyone can join from any point if you haven't joined the last week there is still no restriction you can start any point every time it's a new technique new uh, session and new way of dealing the mindfulness meditation or therapies so um you won't miss anything so you can start the very monday you can thank you very much for that thank you very welcome how can manage home cooking as mindfulness <laughs> i think we are so trained in cooking that we don't use even our mind sometimes do we excellent example <laughs> yeah. new person like me will will be very mindful <laughs> who doesn't cook all the time yes yes um, monday is same time 6 to 7 with the same id to join in 
if you haven't received uh, information on the Monday group, you can join with the same ID you joined today and six to seven, same time. 